We've probably all seen the Peanuts cartoon where one day Snoopy decides to write a novel. And he has a big discussion with uh, the kids about this novel. And so he's up on the rooftop with his typewriter, with his paws on the typewriter, and he starts his novel. It was a dark and stormy night. Well, that's the way it felt in 2020 uh, when what looked like a dark, powerful storm was approaching our country. And uh, it, it just, it felt like a science fiction movie that you were seeing something you couldn't control, but you, well, you know, that only happens in the movie. But it didn't. It was this evil, deadly force that kind of drew itself closer to us. And that's what we did. We came to the West Coast and we watched it step by step move further and further uh, across the nation. It was on an, an afternoon of March 13, 2020, that we had gotten a, a call from the president's office at the college saying that there needed to be an emergency meeting. And so I was the chair of humanities and fine arts. Karen was the chair of social science. And so we pack up and we go to the presidential conference room. And as we all huddle there together as, as faculty leaders, the statement was made, uh, COVID is now on our campus. And what can we do about it? And of course, you have the science teachers and the nursing uh, uh, instructors, and we start the bannering about how do we control this? How do we handle this? And in the end, there was only one option. You got to shut down the school. Now, for Sneed, that wasn't as big a crisis as it was for uh, some colleges, because we have been a leader in distance learning since uh, around 2000 uh, with video capturing programs and online courses uh, for a long time uh, we were second in the state in distance learning next to Troy University and so we had already moved to a platform where even our live classes used a learning-based platform to submit homework and to take tests and so it wasn't really a major deal to take your live classes and move them online to finish out the semester. Some institutions weren't prepared for all of that and went through a lot more effort to make it right. But what happened if it moved on, suddenly colleges and schools and entire school systems began to shut down because they didn't know what to do. Uh, children became proficient in computer technology all the way down to kindergarten. Uh, parents were put in the role of home tutors. Uh, teachers uh, sat in front of an empty classroom, looked staring at a, a screen trying to teach and instruct. Uh, it was a whole different thing. Um, and then what happened in the middle of, of all of this preparation of the people telling us what we have to do to be safe, where we need to go to be safe, there comes this uh, anti-culture bounce. People began to rebel because they didn't want their children out of school. They rebelled because they, their children weren't going to wear masks. Masks were dangerous. Uh, they said that the scientific evidence that this uh, disease was what it was, was all wrong. And so they marched on schools and just all these blazing flames of of conflict came about. And there's no doubt that students suffered. They always said they'll catch up over a period of time. They're still talking about that now. Uh, as, as these students are going through school, they keep saying, well, they're not quite back from that one year that they missed completely out of balance. Um, and of course, what followed suit, uh, businesses closed, offices shut down, uh, Restaurants would close down. Face-to-face -face meetings were Zoom and Skype. Uh, 
companies mandated people not to even come into offices. I think my daughter was into Arsenal. She was forbidden to come on to Arsenal during all this time. Uh, and during all this shift in turmoil, I decided I needed to update my desk for my home office, go up to Staples, go back to the back to look at their desk, and there's nothing really there. And so when I say something to one of the salesmen, he says, well, you know, since this COVID stuff's hit, we can't keep the desk because everybody's starting their own home office. And put that together. Uh, restaurants closed. And some hung in by becoming uh, drive through restaurants. Uh, others, especially the little mom and pop stores, closed. Many of those didn't open. I know that during the pandemic, there were three or four local uh, restaurants in Gunnersville that we would kind of rotate around on Friday night, our date night, and we'd pick up a meal and bring it home so that we could at least try our best to support the local restaurants. And we even know up till now, every fast food institution you pass and every restaurant you pass has hiring notices out there. And sometimes you go into a restaurant and you have to wait and only half the tables are busy. They just don't have enough people to work them. So it really created a massive, massive problem. And then what really set the thing off for us as a nation is that in the mix of all of this, we let the disease become political, which was an extreme disaster. Uh, I'm in my 70s, and I remember as a child being notified that we would be uh, taking the polio vaccine. And we got a, a, a note, uh, and I can't remember, was it three doses that you had to take? Uh, every like every week or every other week, and you'd go to a local school and they would give you a, a sugar cube with a red dot on it, and you'd take that polio vaccine. The people going there knew what polio was all about. They had lived with it, and now something was available to do something about it, and there was no rebellion. People just packed up and headed out and never ask a question. At one point in time, there was a, a guy uh, on the news when they had opened up for shots. He was the first one there, an elderly man. And they were going to interview him. They said, so why have you come? He said, because I was in the 70s, uh, I was in my 70s or 60s. And he said, I went through all this with the polio vaccine. And he said, I'm not going through that again. So I'm getting my first. And uh, so many of us understood that. Some of them questioned the availability of it. Some people criticized and said the disease was just publicized. They offered uh, alternative methods of curing the disease, like drinking Clorox or taking animal pills, uh, because it was just ruining their lives. In uh, March of this year, the National Health, World Health Organization, the World Health Organization, cited that there had been 760 million cases of COVID around the world. And that's the confirmed, and almost 7 million deaths. In the United States, we had uh, 102 million confirmed cases, over a million deaths, and these numbers are still rising because the disease is still with us. Karen made a comment this morning as we were getting ready for church. She said, you know, we really thought that in the age that we live in, with medicine and science at the level that they are, that we would have never faced anything like that. But it did. It really caught us off guard. And one of the saddest stories, uh, and you may know more about this than I do, it was on the news about a local businessman who said that COVID was not real and got real aggravated about it. Uh, he ran a business, and he wouldn't let anybody in his business who wore a mask. 
because he, he was that adamant that it was a fake disease, ranted and raved about it, and then before the end, he catches COVID and he dies. It reminded me of that story of the the man who had the fields and had these super crops growing up, and he said, you know, I'm going to say to my soul, eat, drink, and be merry, because what all have I have? And God just turns and says, you fool. This night, your soul will be, will be required of you. And so there was a greater tragedy for some of us, uh, because even places of worship turned into political ba uh, battlegrounds and medical battlegrounds, uh, especially throughout the course of things, uh, small congregations and conservative religious groups just denied the fact that it would happen. I don't know how many tales I heard uh, from close people that said, well, our church has decided just not to do much about it. And then time after time after time, they had to close the church during this time because COVID had, uh, COVID had gotten so rampant in the church. It just circled around the church staff and nobody really seemed to care about it. Uh, but it was something that really made a difference. On the other hand, uh, a lot of the larger churches, more progressive, the mainstream groups, uh, put in place safety measures and came through it uh, fairly well. Our bishop, uh, Bishop uh, Deborah Wallace Pageant, reminded the North Alabama Conference of the uh, guiding principles of John Wesley for people who call themselves Methodists. And the first one of those on the list was do no harm. And we saw, heard that here in our church. That's why we had our masking. That's why we had our distancing, because we were following the rules for, put out, you know, do no harm. That's why for a long time we didn't even have service. Uh, we, we, the conference basically shut things down until we could get a handle on what was going on. Uh, Pew Research was conducted in May 2020 and said that more than 90% of regular churchgoers in the United States said that their churches had closed down in order to combat the disease. Uh, many churches went completely digital. Uh, our church and churches like this, especially the churches that had contemporary worship services, because those services were already in the media, uh, didn't really have too much of a problem even going into their traditional elements and creating their online worship. Uh, even small to medium churches were finding places in their budget to buy equipment and technology to keep the community together uh, and keep it moving. Uh, pastors preached to empty uh, sanctuaries. Choirs were often substituted uh, by soloist or small groups who stood at a safe distance. Uh, what was once a world uh, for televangelists, it is now mainstream to have your worship service online. Uh, three years after the start of all of this, the church looks much different because many churches didn't cast that away after COVID stopped. They are continuing these online processes. Uh, and like many of the restaurants, especially some of the smaller churches, uh, they just did not survive. And I've seen for sale signs on several small churches and it kind of breaks your heart knowing the, what they had to go through. I have an interesting anecdote about Okay. About. So for me and I were in Mobile in March of 2020. Was, nobody knew it was out there, but it seemed like it just hit Alabama's line that weekend, mm -hmm. the first weekend of March. So she spent six and plus hours on the phone in the car coming back from Mobile because they closed the conference early and sent everybody out and setting up that first online service. Right. I mean, literally, she and her staff, it took six hours to, to put it all together. All the forces together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we, we, we knew what was going on. 
it, uh, it really made a difference. Um, uh, Leonard Sweet had, uh, I had contacted him. He was a non mentor for my doctor's ministry. He was a very influential writer and speaker. Uh, I call him the closest thing to a prophet that I know. But he had, I wrote him while I was doing part of this research, and I said, uh, Man, do you have anything on church statistics and how uh, COVID has affected the church? He said, yes, I just finished a document. I sent it to the church in South Africa, and I'll just send you a copy of it, about 40 pages of it. <laughs> and as I was digging through that, I guess it's because of uh, seeing the name J.R.R. Tolkien in the mix of all of this. Uh, in one of his writings, The Lord of the Rings, there's this conversation between Frodo and uh, Gandalf, and Frodo's talking about the ring. He said, I wish the ring had never come to me. I wish none of this had ever happened. And Gandalf replied, so do all who live to see such time, but that is not for us to decide. All you have to decide is what to do with the time that has been given to you. And that's what was going on. We were trying to make a decision about how we handle that time. And then he made a very powerful statement. He said, when people are racked in fear, facts and data don't matter. We are less willing to trust the people, trust professionals. We try to think for ourselves. Uh, when faith becomes transactional, it's the opposite of what makes faith faith. And so the global threat came to our nation, uh, and we worked through it and, and really uh, stretched ourselves to try to become something other. Oliver Wendell Holmes has a, a stating that when a man's mind is stretched by a new idea or a sensation, it never goes back to its former dimension. And so COVID stretched us beyond where we wanted to go. And so for the research part of this, I thought I need to go back to where I started and take a look at the communities and how they were affected. And so I started looking at the Jewish community and seeing how the Jewish community was affected by COVID. And like many faith communities, that people that we have tracked, especially in the Christian, uh, people are saying that COVID did not start something COVID accelerated what was already happening. Uh, within the Jewish community, many of those communities had already moved toward a media-based experience. Uh, they say the numbers of Jewish participants in, in the community have not changed, but the institution itself has taken a major, major hit. Uh, Rabbi Moshe of the, what is it, Kabbad? Uh, temple here in Huntsville said his uh, congregation doesn't even gather for worship anymore. They do everything online. They have small groups online and try to see what they can do to help in the community. Uh, he said there's a major challenge to get people together again because they're so comfortable with an online experience. And that is a, something that is echoed all the way through. I, I sent a note to my friend in Oxford, Rabbi Norman Solomon, and he said, well, our congregation is an older congregation. And he said, we just don't meet. And we try to stay in contact with each other, but we just don't meet. He said the younger people in the, in the group do gather by Zoom and, and uh, things, and said, but they're comfortable with that, and a lot of the older people aren't. So he said that's what they carry on. Uh, he said... After three years of COVID, synagogues now have a new normal. Uh, Rabbi Jamie Albert said, we're not going back. We're just moving forward to whatever is the next new normal. And I looked at the Catholic Church to see what was going on there. The, the biggest hit that the Catholic Church took theologically was in a crisis like this, how do you continue 
to offer the Eucharist to people because that is such a bedrock part of their faith. And so they, you know, they kind of pulled in some things sometimes like we did. They almost had a drive through uh, communion, uh, Eucharistic thing to try to help them through the crisis. Uh, attendance at Catholic churches dropped. Uh, the number of people missing worship on a regular basis rose from 11 to 18 percent post COVID. So their numbers and their outreach is down. I looked at the black church. Uh, and, again, and here again, what they said was that the process that had started pre-COVID, that is with the loss of church activity, was accelerated because of the pandemic. And one interview was talking to a pastor of a, of a Zion church who in 1960 had more than 1,500 parishioners attending worship in the 60s. He said, attendance began to diminish over time. After COVID came, Zion's attendance is now down to 125. From 1,500 to 125. Pew Research said Black Protestants now worship has dropped from 61% going to worship to just 46. Uh, the Black church is the only group now with more than half of their uh, worship attenders doing it virtually. Um, and one of the things that kind of came to my mind, I don't know if you've ever been to a Black church, uh, but you experience Black worship in an antiphonal situation. Uh, the preacher says something, the congregation answers back, and the preacher responds. And there's this interaction that goes on that is a dynamic that just really creates all of this. Uh, the first time I was really deeply involved in that, I was listening to a, a black minister who was rather well known, and he started his sermon, and all these people up front kept talking back at him. And I said to myself, if they would hush, I could hear what the preacher said. But that's the way that was. That's the nature of the way that they worship. How did that work in a technological world? How did a black minister who is used to this feedback and energy uh, find that when he's standing in an empty sanctuary or maybe doing his sermon in his office? I know it was a crisis time for them. So, uh, so have you ever spoken at a black church? I haven't spoken at one. Well, I, I went to one. It was. They were heading to Martin Houston that he played football at the University of Alabama. And they told me to be sure and come out with one of his teachers. I told him that. And I noticed when I got there, I was on the program. So I said, I'm sorry. They were up in Germany. What do you say? So the first thing I said, they answered that. Tell it to a sister. Oh, no. Answer by the time that was. Okay, what I said, but I went on and on. That energy. <laughs> and that's what it is. It, it draws. It draws. Uh, in old Methodism, we would say "Amen" and pump him up a little bit. Now the preacher has to ask for an "Amen," <laughs> and we we catch Diedrich doing that quite often. <laughs> and, well, where is it? Uh, yeah, Larry Dale one time in, in, in one of his sermons said said to us. If y'all had talked back to me, you'd get a better sermon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dan Cox, uh, who wrote an article for the American Enterprise Institution, said, what happened in the pandemic is that all of us were huddling in the basement while a tornado was going over our heads. Now that everybody has come out of the basement, everything is different. Uh, the median congregation, that is big church, little church, everything. The median congregation pre-COVID was 137. Post-COVID in 2020, or just after 2020, that number dropped to 65. The average number in a worship service. Um, across all churches or is it? That, that connects all churches. Uh, the Gallup poll did a, a survey uh, and said that part of what they sense as a dilemma 
in this post-COVID world is that children are not following in the footsteps of their parents like they used to. Now, I'm a boomer. And when I got up on Sunday morning, there was not an option for what I did. You know, you packed it up, you went to church. Sick, no matter what, you went to church. And then we have, we reached a point where with varying types of worship services, well, we could we could go here and our children would go there. And now the children are making a decision whether or not they want to go or not. Uh, one of the things that was interesting about this, uh, and I don't think I actually put that statement in the book, but I meant to, I had looked at statistics about the recovery of worship and how that there is, has been a, a recovery element in the traditional style of worship. And we can tell that in our church. Our traditional service, uh, at least from where I sit up in the choir on Sunday morning, looks pretty good, you know, all in all. But what they said in the survey was that they found out that the contemporary service lost all these people and they're not coming back. And it's because they have gotten so comfortable with getting up, grabbing a cup of coffee, and sitting in front of a computer for worship. And according to their research, they don't see that the contemporary service is going to make a rebate. And we're struggling with that right now ourselves. That the that the, our traditional service came back much faster and the uh, contemporary service has not made the bounce. Uh, I had meant to get with some of the staff this past week to see how many, uh, how they are attracting the online worshipers. Because we have a large, you know, a large group for our traditional worship. I'd like to know how many are in that contemporary block and how many are, are people beyond the walls of the church are really connecting with the church. Uh, far enough from the impact crater of the original 2020 to start getting some interesting right. results 2022, 2023 and forward to see how many people are actually online, how many of those maybe transition back to live and right. how many left. The only anecdote I can offer was when everything was closed down, we've got a friend, Matt Cotton, he runs a, a little church down in Pensacola and they were online real quick. You, know, they, you can come in person or you can be online. In a little, you know, little small church. You said tithing went up. I was going to tie giving in and uh -huh. uh, their giving rose right. up significantly during that period of time. And uh, so when we went and visited them down there uh, in in uh, late 2020, and when I got back, I would actually continue, I would dial in, dial in uh, go online for his service. So I'd be out running, I'd have his service mm -hmm. on, so I could kind of see. And they had there'd be people in person, but there would be you could tell how many people were on. Right, right. And so not too long ago, maybe three or four months ago, I, I went back on every like two online. Everybody else is is yeah, back yeah. in. So it's kind of that I got me thinking, yeah, what's that dynamic across the whole space, right? right? I don't right. Know anybody else, but um, but that was an interesting point that giving was up. Now I haven't talked with him since to see rec post recovery, you know, where where is that now and their right. overall attendance. And that was a an unusual statistic about worship in Great Britain. So during COVID, worship in Great Britain really took a jump for the good. Because they had almost completely gone non-Christian, but it was all online worship. It was not in-person worship, so it was, it was the draw there, uh, probably primarily from fear. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Yeah. So, do you think there are other aspects? I know, um, like a friend of mine, her daughter went to college, and she said they programmed her, and so she went away from Christianity. She doesn't even come back to see her mother anymore because she was told that she was a Christian that she's a fanatic or something. And so, you know, I've heard that a couple of times. And it's, it, it, you know, in that break during the, in the last few years, a lot of this 
So I don't know if that plays into it a lot too, that that you're getting that um, anti-Christian view right. from a lot of the, you don't see a lot of young people, but you know, 20, 20 year olds here. And my son's struggling with that because he goes to a class, there's two people in it. Mm -hmm. And that's and, that I would say that's probably true just about everywhere. It's that 20 to 24 age group, or probably the 18 to 24. You know, first year of college home through, they're just absent, completely absent. Uh, when I when I taught at Sneed, uh, I taught ethics and society was my big class. I probably had about 300 students a semester in that. And then I taught religion courses. I knew an Old Testament and world religion, and I'd have another hundred in that. And so because of teaching ethics and religion, uh, I would have students come and talk to me every so often about that. In my ethics class, the first thing I would do is I would hand out a, uh, a personal worksheet profile so that a student could answer some questions and kind of see how they looked. Of course, the first one was, do you know your heritage? Uh, did, did, do your roots go back to Germany or England or Africa or Mexico? You know, these types of things. Down the list, I asked about their faith base. You know, where is that rooted? That's when I really discovered, and I didn't know this before, that Baptist was a religion. Because they would say, my religion is Baptist. And I'd say, no, it's Christian, and you're a Baptist part of that. But when I started teaching back in 2005, uh, a little time, I, I would, it would be an extremely rare occasion that somebody put on that line something other than a, a, a statement that connected to Christianity. Uh, Unless they said, well, we just don't go to church. Probably within five years or so, uh, the word agnostic started creeping in. And, you know, when I was a freshman in college, I didn't know what agnostic meant. And I realized that they didn't really either. But they didn't know how to express themselves. Uh, they were struggling with what they did believe and didn't know how to identify it. But it was beginning to show that, that there were struggles coming in uh, to this younger generation. And as the time went on, before I uh, came off college in 2020, uh, out of the live setting, uh, I was getting answers like atheist and Wiccan and none. There had been a major, major shift. And so these people would come to me and talk to me and uh, try to figure out what was going on in the world. One gal came and just sat in my office and wept because she had literally been kicked out of her church because she had a baby. Another one came uh, and said that they had been uh, removed from the church role because they had a tattoo. And another one who came to class all dressed in, in black a goth drift, finally got pushed out of her church. And when I would hear these statements from these children, I, you know, it'd be like, no, no wonder there's tension going on uh, in all of this. Uh, because of all this moving around, Leonard Sweet talked about education and church and technology. In a world where you can get a degree from anywhere and never attend there. I got a hat full of degrees and I've never taken an online course, but I taught them for 15 years. So the, I, I have a one way experience with some of that. But Lynn Sweet said that after the pandemic, he said, now there is a new front door for the church and it's the internet. And so the only thing that holds our faith great group together now in many locations is just small group meetings. They worship online and then they have what we would call like a Sunday school meeting or a small group meeting somewhere uh, 
place to place. Many older adults now go to contemporary worship, not because they particularly like it, but it's because where their children and their grandchildren go. Or that they like to go in most churches, their contemporary service is at eight or nine o'clock, and the elderly group said, I'm going to get up early, got to get up early anyway, and then I'll be to lunch before the Baptist. So uh, they just move on. So I agree with that chorus. As I look across church history, the pandemic didn't start something. It accelerated something that was already happening in society. And it really jump-started a lot of that. And so that kind of moves us to the questions, you know, when did you come face-to-face -face with COVID? If you're, you know, that may be like uh, people remembering when John Kennedy was shot or or when the tower was struck at 9-11, that I remember when I found out about that. Or how did it affect your home situation or your community? We just kind of had a softer experience with COVID. Everybody has, has lost somebody along the way. It was late into it was 2020, maybe 2021 before we had lost anybody yet. But we knew it was more of just the dynamics of life. Mm -hmm. I was traveling a lot for work and we never stopped. We right. got a big test that year and it was going to happen no matter what. So our whole team traveled regularly uh, on big steel cylinders with masks on, which if you hadn't had a panic attack, try, try <laughs> one of these modern airplane seat situations and wear a mask, that'll get you a panic attack. <laughs> um, so we just flew right through it. Um, and um, still managed to try to make some life out of the, out of the mix. So I think we, as a family, we weathered it pretty, pretty mm -hmm. well. Um, David lost but, his life. But it was the, it was the, the dynamic of it. Yeah, David lost a, a very good teacher uh, late into that. Um, he was working on his Eagle Scout, so trying to keep that path right going. Right. In fact, that 2020 winter, he had to have a winter camp, uh, or, you know, a long camp, mm -hmm. and there were three winter camps, or, or three long camps conducted in the entire country in 2020, mm -hmm. and one of them was Camp Comer here in Ohio, right. and it was massively attended. There was a okay. big, big turnout for that, and so so things came together where they did, but yeah, there, there was loss along the way, too. See, my work experience was very different because I, they were telling us even before we were sent home that, you know, to be ready when it looked like we were mm -hmm. going to be you know, sent home. And um, on, on March 13th, the word came down. And I was a supervisor, so I was being kept in the loop. And I had to communicate with my folks. Word came down, take your computer home and don't come in. You know, don't come back on Monday. And I worked from home for over the next two years. Yeah, we weren't TDY, we were home, which was interesting dynamic too, talking about technology. Prior to COVID, working for the federal government, you could always telework. There was that option, right. but there was a huge stigma. If you, you know, your supervisor looked at you crossways, <laughs> his boss looked at you crossways, and they wondered why you were going home and not doing anything. <laughs> that completely flipped. Right. Immediately, instantaneously, it was the best idea ever. It's our tool for survival. <laughs> and I've never seen anything switch so fast. Yeah. So a lot of a lot of our organizations still tell it works regularly. We're in two days, well, uh, two days a week, which works out to five days a week. Well before I retired, we were having the same problem. You're talking about people not wanting to come back to worship, sir. We have the same problem at work. Right. right. Well, people didn't want to come back. Even today, uh, someone was telling me they had a big team meeting about the word was coming down. So you had to come in two days of pay period. Yeah. <laughs> two weeks long, probably. Two days. You know, just riotous behavior out of that. Yeah. You know, I'm like, yeah. yeah. You know, hires, that's, that's the thing. You know, when you're looking at new hires, they want to be hired where they are. They don't want to move. Yeah. Right. And they don't want in, they don't want to come into the office, and that's why they come to work for you. Yeah. And if you have to tell them otherwise, they don't want to come to work for you. 
The other thing that is interesting, and I'm seeing a parallel in what you're talking about, though, it has to do with, um, you know, being together in the workplace, you know, I think that that builds a sense of family. And my company, that's part of our mission vision statement is that to be a family oriented company. And uh, I've had a conversation with the owner about how even after the pandemic that that family atmosphere has suffered significantly because people are not in the same space. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's the same in church too, mm-hmm. that if you don't see the people in person, you know, you, you were talking about the, the the synagogues and how they're like 100%. Mm-hmm. Like, how do you have a, a, a cohesive, like, it's how is it not entertainment as instead a of community? community? Uh, yeah, right. worship is, right. I mean, yeah, I don't attend all the time, but I still feel like that that's an important thing to do, and that's part of worshiping God for one thing to do it in with more than one yeah, of us community. together, right. corporate worship. Yeah, mm-hmm. versus me sitting in front of my television, I do that to watch a movie. <laughs> you're right. You know, it's not the same thing. And the tools are great if you're sick and can't go that way. Oh, well. granted, right? Or even a, a distant employee, you know, you can use that tool to bring him in, but. It, it does seem to me to be something to use only in place of somebody being able to come and be in person. Well, it's absolutely I mean, great to have the opportunity to telework. I think that's something that, that we should continue to offer folks, but to have that and then mirroring that. In well, the you church, said it. You, you said it too about how you you're kind of in the workplace. You're kind of hybrid, mm-hmm. and I think that maybe that's something that can be encouraged in the worship place too, so that you know. Not necessarily a hundred percent away, but maybe hybrid. Right. That and I think that's part of what the Sunday evening meal yeah. was trying to do, uh, hoping that people who brought children to the children's program or the youth program or the study sessions that go on here would be able to get together in one place uh, and, and have an experience. The last chapter was one that I had titled A View from the Edge of Clouds, uh, Seeing Things Differently. And this is one of the cartoons that can't show you, (laughs) a non sequitur. Uh, But I had it on my door in my office for years and years. And it was an image of Heaven's Gate. And it was a big overarching thing. And then in the middle of it, it said, Welcome to Heaven. And on the right side, there was a sign over the door that said, right religion. And on the left side, there was a sign over the door that said, wrong religion. And these two angels are standing over to the side, smiling, and said, they never get the joke. Both doors are entrance into heaven. And so that's kind of what it felt like sometime uh, in the struggle of what it means to get in the right door or the wrong door. How do you do things right? How do you know that you do things right? Um, When I was first starting in the ministry, uh, one of the things I wanted to do was do worship right. Uh, When I was in seminary, I studied worship and patterns of worship. Uh, As I got out, I I became a a member of the Order of St. Luke, which is a Methodist-based organization for people to study and examine how liturgy is supposed to be done in the church, how you're supposed to handle the elements, how you're supposed to uh, go through uh, funeral uh, services and weddings. and, And I just always want to do the thing right, but yet you're always not sure of if you're doing it right. Uh, and you question that. People would always say, well, I just want to go ahead and get my church back to the ancient way of worship and unclutter it. But how do you define ancient way? There's a traditional way, and we do a lot of that. Uh, I've always challenged those people in my congregations to actually participate in the uh, saying of the Apostles' Creed. 
and the Lord's Prayer. In one church that I served in the Birmingham area, a family started attending there, and, and he talked to me early on right after they started, and he said, I just can't get this order of worship down just right. He said, this saying the prayer and, and doing a creed, he said, it just kind of seems foreign to me. Five years later, when I left that church, he came to me and he said, when I first came, I did not like the order. But now I find a sense of spiritual peace and connection by saying that prayer and doing that creed and affirmation. Um, so we all struggle with that. How do we get back to this right worship thing? Um, the battle that started all of this has waned somewhat. Uh, the struggle of contemporary against uh, traditional or classic worship, because we've finally kind of gotten on a level ground, understanding both of us are after the same thing. You bring people to Christ, and you just do it one way, and I do it the next. Uh, so, but we have expectations. Uh, did I tell you all the story about my mother-in-law in this class? When, when I was working on my doctorate of ministry, I had just been moved to a church uh, in North Birmingham. All I lacked was to finish up my document, and then I was going to be ready to defend. And so the church made a, a suggestion. They said, well, why not during the month of August, you just take care of Sunday morning worship, and then you can finish up your document and we can move on. I said, okay. So we happened to go up to Karen's uh, parents' home in North Carolina. And I will preface that by saying these are two saints of people. You know, in, in my opinion, they were saints. And so we're in there. And, of course, her mother and I uh, always seem to have religious jocularity going on. And she said to me one day, she said, oh, so uh, what are you doing on Wednesday night this summer? I said, I'm not doing anything on Wednesday night. You're not? You're not going to church on Wednesday night? And I said, no. Well, why not? I said, Jesus never went to church on Wednesday night. But what are you doing on Sunday night? Nothing. You're not doing church on Sunday night? No. But why? Jesus never went to church on Sunday night. And then that's when she said, you blame everything on Jesus. <laughs> or Jesus didn't go to church on Sunday anyway. But, but that's kind of the, the way it goes. How we got to where we are. We've talked about all of that uh, working and our expectations of, of what, why we do what we do. Leonard Sweet made a good comment about that. He said, Jesus never tried to prepare us for an afterlife. He tried to prepare us to be better people in the here and now. There's that old saying that some people are so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. And that's what he was kind of pushing at there. Uh, that we have to move beyond these things to realize it's not about how we worship God, it's how we connect to God. George Barna uh, made a statement, said, we are living in a culture that's so infiltrated with change that we have forgotten that the church is about transformation, not just change. And so in the process of all of this stuff, I, I conducted a survey, and everybody loves a survey. And uh, so I passed it out, and of course it was in, re in regard to worship styles and preferences. And at this time, 58% of the congregation prefer a class, what I termed classic or traditional worship service. 32% chose a different style. Uh, you conducted a survey here when uh, Charles Gaddis was pastor. I actually have a copy of it. Uh, but it didn't go quite, it, it didn't name how many went to, it was Cappuccino in Christ, is that what it was? versus the traditional, I, I didn't have those numbers. But the next part of it came the same. 
what are the most important elements of worship? And your survey and mine were almost spot on. The results look like this. The, the most important thing to people when they come to church, they said, was music. The style of music, how it sets them up for their worship service, and that's nothing new. Uh, Jubal in Genesis was the one who was called the ancestor of musicians. David played his harp. The disciples sang in the garden. You had Mozart and, Bart, uh, Mozart and Bach and Isaac Watts and all these contemporary people we talked about. Uh, music can set a stage for us to move forward. And I have often said in my ministry, uh, good music will carry a bad sermon a long way if they're put in the right frame of mind to start off with. And so the, the, the quality of music was also a part of that. They don't want just anything. They want good music. And of course, in traditional service, that definition of good music is different than what you would say good music is in the contemporary service. But it, it has to be of a good level. The second is the preaching or the proclamation itself. And the subtitle that kind of floated underneath this was people were saying that they wanted their sermon Bible-based. They wanted scripture sermons where they were taught something, a, a block of scripture out of the Bible so that they could apply it to their lives uh, and move on from there. Uh, what happened in the traditional classical worship uh, mainline worship for years and years were liturgical, where we actually had a, a designated series of gospel readings that you would move through so you preach through the gospels. Uh, I mentioned that I had that five four file cabinet. Three of them are filled with gospel sermons because that's where I did the basis of my preaching. Uh, so I did that. But on the other hand, in the contemporary worship, sermons were more topical. Let's talk about faith. Let's talk about marriage. Let's talk about how you handle your finances. Let's talk about how you deal with your struggles. The tension kind of came in because when you would go to a church and your church would have a nine o'clock contemporary and an 11 o'clock traditional and one senior minister. And the single pastor had to preach to both. And there is a different dynamic about how you preach to a more comfortable, relaxed group than the people in the coat and ties. So that came part of it too. And then finally, the third part of it, which was interesting, was their concern about prayer. And, and I think we do a good job of praying in our church. Uh, prayer comes into a menagerie of things from different churches. There, Our church, uh, one of our pastors usually leads a prayer along. Uh, there are church traditions where the preacher just stands up and looks across the congregation and says, Mr. Smith, why don't you just lead us in prayer? And then people either stand up or kneel at the, uh, uh, the, the pew right there and do it. However you do it, uh, the point is to allow people to reach a place where they can look heavenward and simply say, Lord, here I am again. I was always a firm believer in having a little bit of silence in my pastoral prayers. Give my congregation an element or a, a moment to say their own prayer, to, to lift up their own need instead of kind of getting lost in some of it, uh, where we can actually reach out and touch. So as we look at all these different styles, uh, what we're going to find is that at some point in time, there will be those people in traditional and contemporary worship service who, like ancestors in the past, are going to say, this is nice, but this isn't working, this isn't right. And they're going to go out and they're going to start another model of worship. That's what happened for almost 2,000 years. And when that happens, we're going to find ourselves in a battle line situation again because we're going to say we're doing it right 
and you're doing it wrong. And so, in the bottom of it all, as I kind of sit on top of the cloud looking at it, what all has transpired over these few weeks of, of talking about this, uh, I kind of take a look from up there. And from a distance, when you look at all the worship, worshiping communities and whatever their style and whatever their mode or modem of worship, they basically all look the same from up above because they're all doing the same thing. They're trying to get individuals to connect with the Spirit of God. So, we reached that end of things. You know, in the questions in this chapter, because it was primarily centered around the, uh, the surveys, you know, uh, you got music and preaching and prayer. There's other elements of worship that are just as important. Uh, for the last five weeks, we've talked about the importance of giving. Then right after that, we're about to start into Advent. It's going to be about expectation, moving toward Christmas and the birth of Christ. I don't know if your top three worship experiences would be the same or maybe in a different order. Um, so I'll just kind of throw that out or just turn it to loose leaf and say, any other thing during the day we said, it kind of come to mind or, or challenged you. So fellowship, but if, if everything's going Zoom-wise, you're not getting that fellowship. Mm -hmm. so, uh, for, for me, I don't disagree with the order. I think they, they maybe they all kind of add up the same thing. I'm looking to have a, you know, a, a, a concise interpretation of a, of a message to help me understand better. Right. So biblical passage, drill down on that. Some ahas that I hadn't thought about. Same reason I would study a, a section of a group of people. But then in that congregational element, it's got some energy or power behind it when you're there. So you got the music, you got the people around you. And having done contemporary and traditional, I find that the same power or interest in there, at least as an adult, maybe as a as a little kid in the Baptist church and big church, it was mm -hmm. kind of falling asleep. But as an adult, all that liturgy, all that approach and the choir and everything adds that gravitas to the right. Whole thing. Right. But you know, flip over to contemporary the power of the music, the vibe, the group, the, it, mm -hmm. it, something to generate some excitement around you to go with the word. Right. So you know, it's, for me, that's what I look for, and I can find that in both. Um, and, and currently, I find that in the congregation upstairs. <laughs> I lived under a terrible burden my entire years of ministry because of my wife who told me that if I didn't tell her something new every week <laughs> so that she could learn something, then I just didn't need to preach. <laughs> it didn't go quite that deep, but, uh, but it was, but it was a, you, you need to tell me something new, you know, teach me something that I didn't know. And I think that's kind of the challenge that you're saying too. You know, I want to learn something. I want to carry something away from this worship experience. Yeah. Well, that's what's, what's interesting. So I mean, I've, you know, read it enough through it's kind of like proofreading your own paper after mm -hmm. a while you, you kind of lock in and somebody else says we somebody else will say well you know there's did you think about in this particular parable this person's perspective you know you know mm -hmm. so that comes even after years and years of going to church is still you'll still find that right you think that you've exhausted that as a community we've had exhausted all that depth in the bible but it's still there mm -hmm. so anyway so I was surprised that music was the, the first one. I actually go for the message. Right. And, uh, and know, that's what it was here at Trinity. Yeah, in the Trinity survey, uh, the message was was first. Yeah. But I, on contemplation, I was kind of the same way, but in thinking about it, I, I, I kind of could get it because it it's like if it was really bad or absent, it would, it, it would be a problem. Right. So it's that overall framework. Uh, 
quite financially. And some people mm-hmm. lose the worship service, and it does kind of the fellowship, and that is to feel a care and care when I'm there. Mm-hmm. And of course, sometimes it's my fault if I don't, because I'm not being willing to care right. too. Right. But, you know, I wish we could master this a little bit more. I feel like that's like in a lot of times. And I know one time when I visited the church, I really noticed that I was down in Marcus Dale in South Alabama. And I had just had my first grandbaby. I'm excited to get it. And of course, the graders all greeted me. They're so grateful. Nobody talked to me. They spoke to me, but they never talked to me. Or, but tell them about that new thing. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know how you get that. Right. In a right. Yeah. And what we find now, too, is I remember as a kid, when you left church, everybody went out the front door and stood right out, you know, on the steps of the church and just sat around and talked for a while. Uh, now we move on through, you know, to something else. Uh, with our service arrangement, with uh, our, our church schools and classes in between two worship services, you're either rushing off, and now we're going to be rushing off to either a class or rushing off to a worship service. Uh, and we don't have that time to just stop and take a deep breath and yell at somebody across the uh, narthex of the church and get to visit with them. What we're hoping is, though, that with this change in worship times, creating this 30 minute window where people can fellowship, you know, it's like a lot of things. It's an experiment. We'll see how it goes. But that's the intent. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, 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 Probably who's going to be most stressed is whoever's preaching and has to go from one end right. to the other, right. like waiting for the for the different service. But um, but the intent really is for for those of us in the congregation to use that time as a fellowship.